Hi everyone. Hi friends of the planet. My name is Zoe. I'm our Daily Planet's digital content director and we are so excited to have with us Genevieve McDonald, who is a second term representative in the main house of representatives. She is a commercial lobster fisher as well as an advocate for healthy and sustainable oceans. Genevieve, it's so great to have you today. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So tell us, how did you become a fisher? What do you fish and how are you handling the challenges of the pandemic? I grew up on a small island off the coast of Maine called Mount Desert Island, and I was surrounded by a working waterfront. And as a kid, I would go down to the pier and I would ask questions and I would bother people. And I was just really fascinated with the commercial fishing industry and with the marine ecosystem. Bar Harbor is also the home of College of the Atlantic. So I had a good marine environment piece and Acadia National Park is right there as well. So a lot of environmental concerns, a lot of awareness growing up, and also home to this really vibrant working waterfront. So those ideas converged for me, and I was really intrigued by the fishing industry. I did not go directly into fishing after high school. I was a sailor. I did some sailboat racing in the Caribbean. I worked on boats, and I did bright work on yachts. And one winter, I was at a boatyard that also stored lobster boats, and somebody offered me a job, and the rest is history. So that was 15 years ago. And now I'm a captain. I fish out of Stonington, Maine, which is the lobster capital of North America not only just Maine, we have the highest landings of anywhere in the U.S. I also serve on the Maine House of Representatives. I'm on the Marine Resources Committee. I'm also the House Chair of Government Oversight. I'm the Down East Region Representative on the Maine Lobster Advisory Council. I serve on the Maine Climate Council. I'm also the Fisheries Liaison for New England Aquaventus for the Monhegan Project, which is a single turbine test demonstration site for offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. And I have twins, and they turn three on Sunday. I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely believe that. So we're, we're so appreciative of you, you know, telling us a little bit more about your work and your life. And one of the things that we've had a couple guests tell us on Our Daily Planet, scientists, photographers, various people in the industry, is how much ecosystems around the Gulf of Maine and off the waters are, are changing. So I wanted to ask, what are the primary concerns for fishers and the fishing community in Maine? Is it climate change? Is it whales? Is it renewable energy development or all of the above? Um, so it is all those things. And I'm happy to share my observations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I mentioned, I've been in the fishing industry 15 years. When I came into the industry, landings were very different than they are now. The inshore fishery was not as robust as it currently is. And we had more diversification. There were still ground fish boats. There was scallop boats, sea urchins, urchin diving, sea cucumber dragging. There was just a, a greater variety. Now Maine has become very dependent, very single species dependent, where lobster is really key. And this is a very precarious position for a fishery to be in, to be very reliant on one particular species. So lobster landings are directly connected to water temperature. There's an optimum habitat for lobster to thrive in. And right now, my part of Maine, which is Penobscot Bay, is in that optimum habitat. It's concerning that if the Gulf of Maine warms anymore, that the resource will end up shifting northeast towards Canada. And we've seen that progression over the years from southern Maine to mid-coast Maine to where we are now in down east Maine. So we're really at a point where we absolutely we need to address climate change to preserve our future fisheries. The fishing industry is under a lot of pressure right now from multiple sources. So there is concern about climate change in the environment. There is concern about how to put forth best practices to protect the right whale while also protecting the main lobster fishery in our coastal communities. And then also offshore wind. Commercial fishing is a heritage industry. People have been doing it for decades, for generations. It's a legacy fishery and anything new is scary. Renewable energy is one of those things that the fishing industry is really concerned about. They're concerned about displacement. They don't want to lose historical fishing grounds. They're concerned about environmental impacts, you know, EMF, how they can coexist. It's really a new frontier. And it's coming to Maine at a time when the industry is already under pressure from other factors. And so unfortunately, a lot of the good information that's out there, we have answers to a lot of the questions that the fishing industry has, but they're not being heard. Misinformation, political polarization, you know, these these are issues that are affecting us across society, not just here in Maine, but we are certainly feeling the impacts of it when we talk about renewable energy with the commercial fishing industry. Right. That sounds like it's a lot to juggle. I would love to know what the best way is in your view to ensure that the views of the fishing community are heard when it comes to wind development, because you were kind of talking about environmental sustainability and also the needs of the fishermen. Do you think there's a way that 
wind generation and fishing can coexist. What do you think about that? So I do think that it's possible for the fishing industry and offshore wind to coexist. It's going to take a tremendous amount of collaboration and consideration for both parties. The way to communicate with fishermen is to meet them where they are. You're going to docks, you're going to boats, you're going to harbors, you're talking to fishermen who will be impacted with tangible things that we can look at, you know, not on Zoom, but with charts and with maps and with data and really meeting people where they are. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do a lot of that over the course of the pandemic, and it's made these conversations really difficult. Maine has two offshore wind projects. Both will allow us to decide how we want offshore wind to be shaped in the Gulf of Maine. One is a single turbine test demonstration site off Monhegan to test if technology developed by the University of Maine will work here in the Gulf of Maine. It's built from materials that are available here in Maine with a Maine-based workforce. There's a lot of benefits for education, for renewable energy, for jobs. So that's exciting. And then the governor's energy office is proposing a research array, which is a 12 turbine proposal out in federal waters. And that will really give us an opportunity to conduct research on a larger scale. So one turbine will provide some information, 12 will provide a robust amount of information, and we can use that to inform future decisions. We want to know how offshore wind will operate in the Gulf of Maine and make that decision ourselves here in the state of Maine. So I do think the commercial fishing industry and offshore wind can coexist. It's important to have those sighting conversations with the fishermen that will be impacted and not let those sighting discussions be led by politicians or lobbyists or, you know, developers. It really needs to be done in collaboration with the fishing industry and the users in that specific area. That sounds complicated, but also <laughs> really hopeful. I think that would be fantastic for other places around the world to see how renewables and this action to do something about climate change can coexist with industries that are really important. And I wanted to pivot to another point we made earlier about whales and how the fishing community plays into that. You know, the government has a responsibility to protect right whales as a species we write a lot about in our daily planet. But unfortunately, a lot of the fishing gear to help protect whales is pretty expensive. Would it help if the government helped to defray some of the costs of this gear? You know, could this be part of a building back better agenda in your view? So that's a great question. And there's a couple of things here to keep in mind. So for one, I would say that it's not only the government's responsibility, but it's also our responsibility as a society to protect endangered species. And the right whale is certainly one of those species. The fishing industry has made a lot of strides towards participating in protecting North Atlantic right whales over the years. We've put in many different regulations over the years, which have helped. Now we're at a point where more needs to be done. That is the perspective of the scientific community. And I think we'd all agree that we want to save this species. Ropeless fishing is not only expensive, but there's also some questions around feasibility and efficiency and also legality. So when you talk about ropeless fishing, so there are three things that make the lobster industry so successful. One is sustainability. The second is diversity. And the third is profitability. And so when I talk about sustainability, obviously it's the resource. We want to make sure that there is a lobster resource for generations to come. Diversity is what I'm most concerned about when we talk about things like ropeless fishing. So diversity in Maine for us means that we have fishermen that are in 16 foot skiffs all the way up to 60 foot boats offshore. So we have people who fish part-time and students and older folks that, you know, are semi-retired along with our highliners. And we really want to preserve that diversity. And then of course, the third piece being profitability, because if you can't profit from it, if it can't sustain your family and your community, then that fishery becomes somewhat obsolete. So the problem with ropeless fishing isn't just that it's expensive and that that cost barrier would be prohibitive for some fishermen, but there's also an efficiency key. And so you need to be able to haul a certain number of traps within a day in order for it to remain profitable. And then there's a feasibility piece. So we need to know how it's feasibly going to operate and work on the water. And certainly that can be determined through testing. But when it comes to legality, ropeless fishing is illegal in Maine um, because unmarked trawls are illegal. In Maine. So we have to come up with creative ways about how we would address that. And also one other point is ghost gear. So one of the reasons, you know, we have buoys and we have vertical lines and we have marking is so we can see where each other's gear are. So if you set a 15 trap trawl crossed over another 15 trap trawl, then there's a big chance that both of those trawls will become ghost gear as one boat tries to lift it and can't and it parts off. So then you have an environmental and a pollution concern. So cost is certainly a piece of the puzzle, but there are other questions that also need to be answered before ropeless fishing would be feasible. And absolutely, when we get to the point where all of those kinks have been worked out, because I believe in science and technology and there's smart people working on this, certainly a 
assistance from the federal government will help us maintain the diversity that makes the Maine lobster industry so unique and so awesome. Yeah, that, that's really a, a lot to consider there. So thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. And you mentioned earlier that you have two daughters. You're also a representative in the Maine State House. So how do you manage it all? A lot of our audience is moms who are interested in saving the planet so their kids can have a better world to live in. How do you manage that? Do you have any advice for other moms who are looking to get involved in a similar way? So I do have two kids. I have three-year-old twins, Evelina and Elise. And I often tell people that lots of people have two kids. I just happen to have two that are the same age. So it seems like a lot. And some days it is, but it's certainly not insurmountable. I did run for office while I was pregnant with twins. That certainly... Some wow. people thought that I was foolish, but I'm really glad that I did it. And I'm glad that my kids are going to grow up in this atmosphere of movers and shakers and people that will hopefully help guide them. I couldn't do it without the support of my husband and the support of my trustworthy daycare that I absolutely adore. So, you know, it's it's possible to do everything, but you absolutely have to have a support network, whether it's a, you know, a partner or a childcare center or family or friends, but I certainly couldn't do it alone. Genevieve, I wanted to ask for those of us who love eating lobster, and I know that in DC, lobster rolls are a, a true delicacy, so you can find them everywhere. But if consumers of lobster are interested in eating sustainable lobster, what which things should we be looking out for? Where are the best places to go? Like, what are your tips for ensuring that we're supporting sustainable fishing of lobsters? I mean, you have to eat Maine, right? So Maine has had fishermen initiated conservation measures in place since 1874, and we're very wow. proud of that. And it has led to us having this really abundant and sustainable resource. So I would say the best time of year to eat lobster, if you're really interested in sustainability, is in the summertime when we have lobsters. Lobsters come inshore in the summer and then move back offshore in the winter. So if you come to Maine or you're in DC in the summertime, you're eating lobster that's been caught inshore in the state of Maine, very sustainable fishing practices on a small day boat fleet and helping support Maine fishermen and their families. That's great advice. So for all of our friends of the planet who are also big lobster fans, this is good advice. Genevieve, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I know I learned a lot. You know, these are really good things for us to consider as our nation as a whole works to create a more sustainable future while feeding us and making sure that workers really are at the center of a green transition. So we really appreciate it. Well, excellent. Thank you for having me today. And I look forward to the future. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye.